Our sermon today is titled, 505. 505. I'm going to turn this on. 505. Let's see if this is going to work for me. There we go. 500 years ago, on October 31st, 1517, a mighty reformation exploded onto history's stage. How many of you were aware this last week that we had that we had passed the 500-year anniversary of October 31st, 1517. How many were aware of that? Good. Good. Great to see all those hands going up. I'd love to see every hand going up. When we talk about a reformation, I just want to sort of orient you as to what's contained embryonically and linguistically within the idea of a reformation, right? You have the root word there to form. You have the prefix re. So, contained within the idea of a reformation are two other ideas, and the first is formation, and the second is deformation. If something needs to be formed again, reformed, it must have initially been formed, been created, then been somehow deformed, and now it cries out or calls out for reformation. How did this reformation come about? Well, in perhaps, well, very much so, an unlikely way, a very unlikely way. A 30, 31, 32-year-old Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther began to say really radical, really crazy, really revolutionary things. Things like this. A simple layman armed with Scripture is to be believed above a pope or a council without Scripture. Now, you and I today, we might say, well, what's so radical about that? What's so revolutionary about that? What's so countercultural about that? But in the context social, theological, ecclesiastical context in which this young, brave, audacious Augustinian monk began to speak, it was tectonic, absolutely seismic. In 1521, just about four years after the anniversary that we're celebrating here today, Luther would stand before a council in a city called Worms. We were just there with our tour group. It was absolutely amazing. And he would stand before not only a number of of electors of Germany, he would stand before Charles V, right? The, the, The emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, the man who ruled, as far as most were concerned, the the known world. Right? Charles V sitting sitting right there by all historical accounts. There were so many people packed into the room that it was standing room only, except for Charles V, the only one seated. And in that context where Luther is on trial and his life is literally on the line, his head is on the proverbial chopping block, when he gets to the end of his defense of the great principles that we'll be talking about today, he says these words, here I stand, I can do no other, may God help me. And so this young, provocative, ambitious, and yet also humble monk starts a revolution that we today are the benefactors of. We are the beneficiaries of this amazing revolution. In fact, so is the whole of Australia. So is the whole of the world. Though, it is astounding how few people probably today would understand just how great their indebtedness is to this amazing man. That's what we're going to talk about today. When we talk about reformation, again, contained within the idea that something needs to be formed again, is that it was, number one, initially formed, number two, deformed, and then number three, we're sort of meeting the movie here halfway, halfway into the movie, or two-thirds, three-quarters of the way into the movie here. We're going to talk today about the reformation. And what I've got here on the screen is a bit of a chart, a bit of a chart that shows what you might call the shape or the trajectory of church history. It starts off with the formation of the apostolic church by none other than Jesus Christ himself, who said that he would build his church on a rock and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. We then get to the book of Acts, and 3,000 are baptized on the day of Pentecost, and many thousands more in the book of Acts, and the church is on this amazing upward trajectory, and it looks like everything's going to go great. But in the third and fourth centuries, for reasons that we won't go into today as such, the wheels begin to come off of the apostolic purity, apostolic simplicity of the church, and the church begins to make that difficult and terrible transition from formed to deformed. As the church begins to plunge downward in its deformation phase, we enter what what is referred to colloquially as the Dark Ages, But we don't really use that language much anymore, right? Certainly not in scholarly circles. That's fallen out of favor. But the language historically has been the Dark Ages. Now it's simply called the Medieval Period. The Medieval Period is a period that begins about the 4th century and ends about the 15th century. 
So a period of a thousand years just plopped right there in the middle of history, just stuck there, this dark period, this medieval period, in which, as we're going to see, the church became so radically deformed, so totally deformed from the church that Jesus had established, that finally there were voices that began to cry out, hey, 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 this doesn't look like the church that Jesus had established. And they began to cry out for reformation. Now, Luther was the catalyzing reformer. He was the the rock star of reformers. He was the superstar of reformers, but he was not the first. There were voices before his, voices that we will talk about. In fact, on November 25th, right here, before Pastor Wilson preaches, I'll be giving a Sabbath school on, with slides and be walking through the historical narrative in greater detail of the Reformation. Be walking through that. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And we'll talk about some of these pre-reforming voices, people like Peter Waldo and John Wycliffe and, and uh, uh, Savonarola and uh, others that began to raise these, these concerns about the state of the church. All of these pre-reformers lead up to the one that we're going to be talking about today and who we are celebrating right now in 2017, and that's Martin Luther. And as the church begins that slow, like turning the Titanic, that, that upward trajectory back on Reformation, Reformation will happen just as deformation had happened incrementally and cumulatively. The church didn't go from apostolic purity to the middle of the dark ages overnight. It took a thousand years. It took a thousand years cumulatively of the, the acquisition of human traditions and, and superstitions just cumulatively creating a church that finally demanded reformation. But in the same way that it would take you a while to get really overweight, to get really obese, you wouldn't go to bed fit one night and wake up obese. It would take time. It would be bad habits and too many chips and too many cookies and not enough exercise. And over time, you would begin to put on a lot of weight. And that was the church in the Middle Ages, right? When we get to the 13th and 14th centuries, it's a great big giant job of the hut of a church, hugely obese. Well, you're not just going to come out of that instantly either. You didn't get into it in one step. You're not going to get out of it in one step. And so just as with deformation, the reformation process will be cumulative. That process will have been begun earlier than Luther, but Luther will be the catalyzing voice. He'll be the catalyzing figure. And when we have enough accumulation of reformational steps, we get to restoration, the restoration of apostolic simplicity and purity purity that Jesus had established in the apostolic church. This basic shape of church history, and this is something we have no time to talk about today, was actually anticipated in Bible prophecy. Say amen if you knew that. Did you know that? Did you know that this is the very shape that that Daniel said church history would have? This is the very shape that Jesus said church history would have, that John said it would have, that, that, that Paul said it would have? And so not only are we looking back on something that has been, but even in the days of Daniel and of Jesus and of John and of Paul, they could look forward and see what the shape of church history would be. Formation, deformation, reformation, and restoration. If you want to attach rough dates to these four chapters, the church is formed when when Jesus comes on the scene as Messiah, A.D. 27. We then get to, probably apart from the resurrection of Jesus, the single most significant event in church history, and that's the conversion of a man named Constantine the Great. I've divided church history here into four chapters, but there are a number of church historians that say that's unnecessarily complex. You can divide the whole sweep of church history into just two chapters, pre-Constantinian and post-Constantinian. Before Constantine, the church was a small, politically powerless persecuted minority. After the conversion of Constantine the Great, the first Roman emperor to ostensibly profess Christianity, the church goes from being a persecuted minority to a politically powerful persecuting majority. And so some historians say there's no need to talk about multiple chapters in church history. You have before Constantine and after Constantine. But for our purposes here today, we go from formation to the post-Constantinian, the beginning of the medieval period, the Dark Ages. That's the period we're going to be talking about today, the Deformation period and then the Reformation period, right? From AD 312, Constantine's conversion to 1517. That's the date that we're celebrating now, the 500th anniversary, the anniversary that we are living in the wake of, okay? Then Reformation from 1517 
1844 and then to the present. This is a remarkable book, great big, huge book, academic book published by Yale University Press. Read it in preparation for the series that Lightbearers just did and then read parts of it again in preparation for the tour that I just had the privilege of co-leading. And in this uh, historian and Roman Catholic historian, I might add, Carlos Ayer says, by the 15th century, despite many setbacks and dismal shortcomings, the Pope of Rome could claim universal jurisdiction. <laughs> he could claim what? What are those two words? Universal jurisdiction over all of Christendom. Yeah, even over the whole world. By the time we get to the 14th, 15th centuries, we have fully established a church that is so far removed theologically and methodologically and organizationally from the church that Jesus had established, we are in the, we are in the height of the Dark Ages. And as Protestant historian J.A. Wiley said, the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. When everything was going great for the medieval church, it was going very bad for the rest of the world. The noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. Back to Carlos Ayer. By the beginning of the 16th century, that's where we're introduced to Luther. Beginning in the 15th century, he experiences his conversion in about 1502, right? So heirs right on point here by the beginning of the 16th century. Despite all the cries for reform, the Catholic Church was as rife with problems as the world itself. During the course of the 15th century, the abuses and failings of the church became more conspicuous, more openly discussed, and more deeply resented by a wider spectrum of people. Also, after 1450, the invention of the printing press, we'll talk more about that in just a second. The printing press not only allowed for the wider dissemination of information and reforming ideas, but also speeded up the process of conscious raising among both the laity and the clergy. Information was getting out. Then Ayer says, at the very top, in Rome, the papacy itself seemed the epitome of corruption. An office controlled by worldly men who seem to embody sin rather than redemption from it. Now, I remind you again that Ayer is not only a scholarly uh, historian. I mean, he, he teaches at Yale University. My good friend Jeffrey Rosario takes classes from Dr. Ayer. He is himself a devout Roman Catholic. But he's being very honest and very open with the facts here. When we get to the 15th century, you have a church that is so corrupted, so worldly, that there are necessary internal cries for reform. Say, whoa, 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 we need reform. There's clerical abuse. There's clerical corruption. Right? We need to reform this bad boy. So today we talk about the reformation, and implicit in the idea of reformation is the church was already formed and became grotesquely deformed in the medieval period. Well, when we get right up to 1517, we are, we are seeing, we are encountering the church on the eve of Reformation. We're right on the cusp of Reformation, but in order for Reformation to actualize, to, to be catalyzed, to become real, you're going to need four ingredients. Four ingredients for the Reformation to actually begin to cascade into the remarkable thing that it would be. Number one, you need a mess. You need the church to be a mess, and it was a mess, a giant mess. We're just touching the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg here this morning. The church was a terrible mess. Number two, you need a message, and the message will be contained in two Latin words that Luther would coin. He would also speak them in the German, and they would become the battle cry, the mantra of the Reformational uh, ethos, and that is sola scriptura. Sola Scriptura, only Scripture. So not only do you need the church to be a mess if you're going to cry for reform, you need a message, you need a standard on which to cry for reform, and then you need a means. You need a means. You know what that is right there? You know what that is right there for my teenagers? Do you know what that is? That is the Internet of the 15th century. You are looking at the Instagram, the Facebook, the email the Twitter of the 15th century, that device right there, perhaps as much as any other device in human history, changed the course of civilization. Because all of a sudden, you had, you had easy access to literacy, you had easy access to knowledge, you had easy access to education and information, and the feudal system, the, 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 the ongoing system by which the world had been characterized for millennia, where you have a ruling class and the ruled, began to slowly topple. 
began to slowly topple, and you have the emergence of something that you and I take absolutely for granted. In fact, not only do we take it for granted, most of us in this room are members, card-carrying members of this phenomenon. It's known as the middle class. The middle class. What does that mean, the middle class? It means the class between the rulers, the royalty, and the ruled, the peasants. Well, how do you get an emergent middle class? Not just an intellectual or academic or educational middle class. How do you get a a financial middle class and a theological middle class? And the answer is that machine right there. Gutenberg invents this thing called the movable type printing press in about 1450. And from that point forward, access to information, access to literacy just begins to skyrocket. And as people begin to get their hands on information... The superstitious ruling powers of the day cannot keep people down. You've probably heard before, knowledge is power. And so not only do you need the church to be a mess, which it most certainly was at the height of the medieval period, not only do you need a message, sola scriptura, but if you don't have a means to get that message out, it would be localized. In fact, On November 25th, I'll tell you a story about an amazing reformation that took place about 50 to 60 years before the time of Luther that could only go just as far as the borders of Florence, Italy, because there was no printing press, there was no means, there was no internet. Not only do you need a a message and a means, you're going to need a man. You're going to need a person to stand up and speak truth to power. And that's what Luther is, and that's what happened on October 31st, 1517. Luther, in his famous protest in Worms, when he stood before Charles V and the other august assembly, he said, unless I am convinced, what are the next two words, everyone? Unless I am convinced by Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and the councils, for they have often contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. How many people in here today can say in their heart of hearts, my conscience is captive to the Word of God? Woo, I put my hand up. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. But, but this wasn't uh, uh, Luther saying this in front of 450 people that are his friends, 450 church members, 450 church members that have come voluntarily to hear him preach. No, this is Luther standing before the powers of the world, including the emperor of the world, and he says, I'm sorry. I'm not going to recant, I'm not going to capitulate, I'm not going to acquiesce unless you can convince me by Scripture. And here we have the coining of these, these two words in the Latin, sola scriptura, only Scripture. In sort of academic speak, what Luther was doing was, is he was establishing a new epistemological foundation. Up to that point, the the basis of knowledge, that's what epistemology is, the study of knowledge, you would go to the church, you would go to the priest, you would go to the cardinal, and you would say, what does God think? What does God feel? What is God doing? And they would tell you. So your epistemology, your bedrock was the church, the councils, the popes, the creeds. But what Luther is doing is something totally radical. He's establishing a new bedrock. A new foundation. He's building a whole new structure over here. And he says, don't talk to me about the popes. Don't talk to me about the councils. Don't talk to me about the ecclesiastical assemblies. Show me from Scripture. Show me from the Bible. And if you can persuade me from the Bible, I will recant. And if you cannot, here I will stand and I can't do anything else. God will help me. Out of these two words, it would not be an exaggeration. And preachers, let's be honest, can be prone to exaggeration. But it would not be an exaggeration to say that Martin Luther and Sola Scriptura is the hinge on which the whole of Western civilization turns. Martin Luther and these two words, the the, the great truth contained in these two simple words, Scripture alone, all of Western civilization, of which you are the beneficiary whether you know it or not, hinges on one man standing up and speaking truth to power and saying, I'm not going to move, I'm not going to bend, you can kill this body, you can burn these bones, but I'm going to stand on Scripture. Now, I hope this kind of lights a little bit of a fire under you and you start to think, man, there must be something really powerful, really important, really, really signally significant about this book. Maybe this book is more important than Instagram. Maybe this book more, is a little more important than NRL. Maybe this book is a little more important than HBO. Maybe this book is a little more important. Maybe it is. Luther certainly thought so. 
And I'm hoping that you and I will begin to think so as well. Out of Sola Scriptura grows four other solas. That's why our sermon today is called the 500. That's the 500 years. And the five. The 500 and the five. Because out of the root of Sola Scriptura grows grows four branches, four branches that grow out of that, sola fide, sola gratia, solus Christus, and soli deo gloria. Each one of them in Latin meaning something very important. Let's translate it. Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And these five are the foundation upon which the Protestant Reformation launched. Now, Think about that word Protestant. The root word there is protest. The protest against the excesses of the church. The protest against the corruption of the church. The protest against the power structures of the day. And so these were reformational Protestants. Luther did not believe. That young Augustinian monk did not believe for a moment when he nailed his 95 theses to the door in Wittenberg. And I just stood outside of that door less than a week ago. Luther did not believe for a moment that he would launch this grand thing called the Protestant Reformation. He genuinely, though naively, believed that he would post his 95 Theses to the door, then it would begin a conversation, a conversation within the universities and within the the sacred halls of the Roman church, and scholars and, and clerics and cardinals would begin to debate, and he believed that slowly, incrementally, the church would begin to reform itself. He was in for a surprise. Because in 1518, when he received the papal bull, that means the papal letter of excommunication, it was said to him, you have 60 days to recant. You have 60 days to turn this ship around. You have 60 days or you will be excommunicated, condemned to hell for eternity. You know what he did with that papal bull? He threw it in the fire. He could see that even though he had naively and perhaps optimistically started off on a small, what he hoped would be an internal reformation, as he began to bathe himself in Scripture and began to read in the original language the Hebrew of the Old Testament, the Greek of the New Testament, not going to cardinals, not going to priests, not going to popes, not going to councils, but going to the text. He began to see that there was this giant, tottering edifice known as the medieval Catholic Church, and he said, whatever that big thing is, that monument to human tradition and ingenuity, whatever that big thing is, it's not what Scripture is teaching. And he had a choice to make. He could be a loyalist, or he could speak truth to power, and he chose to speak truth to power, and when he received that papal bull of threat and communication, excommunication, he threw it in the fire. And he said, sola scriptura. And out of that grew sola fide, sola gratia, solus Christus, and soli deo gloria. Now let's walk through each one of these. Because whether you know it or not, if you are today a follower of Jesus who takes Scripture seriously and who takes the fact that you have a Bible in your language, in your language, sitting on your shelf or on your phone, if you take that for granted, if that's important to you, if that's precious to you, if that's valuable to you, then whether you know it or not, this is your legacy. This, this is your story. This isn't just Luther's story. This is your story. If you today are a Christian, a follower of Jesus, somebody who takes Scripture seriously, if you today are a Protestant, or perhaps even more specifically, you're a Seventh-day Adventist here today. We know that we have many that are not Seventh-day Adventists that visit us. If you are a Protestant believer in Jesus today, or maybe you're just a seeker, I want to tell you today, your story is rooted in the protest and in the bravery and in the audacity of a young Augustinian monk named Martin Luther. Let's walk through these solas. In 1302, this guy here, his name was Pope Boniface VIII, released a document called Unum Sanctum. Unum Sanctum in Latin means one holy. There's one church, one holy church, and this was at the height of, as we said earlier, the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. This was at the height of the medieval church's power, and listen to what Boniface says. Listen to the temerity here, the audacity, the, 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 the absurdity. It is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. Yeah, rubbish is exactly right. It's rubbish. It's rubbish, and people began to call it what it was. Again, the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world, said J.A. Wiley. Now think about it. If you have midnight, that's when it's dark. That's when it's dark. And one of the prevailing themes in Scripture, hear me, church, 
one of the prevailing themes in Scripture is that God speaks light into darkness. Can somebody say amen? God speaks light into darkness. Through Luther, God was once again speaking light into darkness. You would know this. The very opening line, the first line that God speaks in all of Holy Writ is, let there be what? Let there be light. Right? This is Genesis 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the earth. So, so the first action that we have of the God of Scripture, the first thing He does is He speaks light into darkness. We fast forward from Genesis 1 to the, to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He goes on to say that this Word was the light. He's the Word that was spoken. He's the light that lights every man that comes into the world. And so both for Moses and for John, when God is going to shape things, when He's going to reform things, when He's going to destroy and build up new things, He speaks light into darkness. That's what God does. The only particular text that we will turn to in our Bible today is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll have a lot of text up on the screen, but join me in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 if you can. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you've got your paper Bible, great. If not, pull out your phone. Hopefully it's on airplane mode so you're not tempted to be distracted by things of lesser importance. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. By the way, I don't think I'm important. I think Scripture is important. I think the Bible is important. I think God is important. And that's what I mean when I say something of greater importance. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. It says, for we do not preach ourselves. I take this as one of my mantras as a preacher. I do my very, very best not to preach David Asherick, right? I am David Asherick, and so when I preach, a little David Asherick is going to leak out, right? That's going to happen. But Paul says, when I preach, I don't preach Paul. I don't preach myself, verse 5, but I preach Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. Now verse 6, I'm not preaching David, I'm not preaching Paul, Paul says, I'm preaching Jesus. Verse 6, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, where? In the face of Jesus. Then in verse 7 he says, and we have this treasure in jars of clay, in earthen vessels that the excellency may be of God and not of us. Let me translate that for you. What Paul says is the same God who in the beginning said, let there be light in Genesis 1, said in Jesus, let there be light. The the darkness that had come upon the world in the time of Jesus was not a literal darkness. It was a theological darkness. It was an intellectual darkness. It was a spiritual darkness. People were confused about who God was. And so Jesus comes to bring clarity. And he brings such clarion uh, uh, pictures of who God is that Jesus could say with, with total humility and yet complete accuracy, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So Jesus brings light into the world, and that's what Paul says. That same God who who spoke light into darkness has has now spoken into an equally dark, equally void, equally vacuous place, into the human heart. He has spoken into the human heart. He's spoken light where there was darkness. And so we find that when, when there is darkness, as Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 60, behold, darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people. I want to tell you right now, friends. I know the sun is shining outside and the water is warm and the waves are good. I got all that. I want to tell you, the earth is covered in gross darkness today. Australia, the United States of America, and the whole of earth is covered in a deep, thick, spiritual darkness. Not everyone, but many. So what's God going to do? Well, what did he do in Genesis? What did he do in John? What's he alluding to in 2 Corinthians chapter 4? What did he do in the days of Luther? He speaks light. He speaks truth into the darkness. Through Luther, God was once again speaking light into the darkness. And in every case, in every case, what is the light that God speaks into darkness? It's his word. In Genesis, it's his word. Let there be light. In John 1, it's in the beginning was the word. What does Paul say? He speaks the Word. What did Luther say? Sola Scriptura, the Word. If there is darkness in your life, you don't need more YouTube. If there is darkness in your life, you do not need more HBO. If there's darkness in your life, you don't need more NRL. 
If there's darkness in your life, you need the word. You need light. Sola Scriptura. Out of Sola Scriptura grew the second of the great solas, sola fide. Only faith. Faith alone, Luther would say. Not works. Not works plus faith. We just had the last sermon that I preached in this church was on this. Faith that. Faith that. Not faith and. Faith that. Let's talk about faith alone. What does that mean? Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Actually, I'm not in faith alone. I'm still in Sola Scriptura. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, I here today am a Seventh-day Adventist, okay? Um, I don't believe that Seventh-day Adventists are the only people of God. I don't believe that for a second. I think God has His people everywhere in every communion and in every faith and even in every religion. I think God has His people everywhere, those, are living up, those that are living up to the light that they have. However, as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor on the Sabbath in a Seventh-day Adventist church, I want to quote for you a few passages from one of the founders and most pivotally important people in the founding of the Seventh-day Adventist church, a woman by the name of Ellen White. I'm going to give you several quotations from her, and here's the first. This one from a book that I'm going to talk about when we get down to the end called The Great Controversy. That's the book, by the way, that I'll be talking about tomorrow in my little lecture that I'm doing at Prophetica titled The Punk, The Parsley, and The Prophet. That's the book that I'm going to be telling the story of in that lecture. And that's the book that I read as a 23-year-old purple-haired tattooed punk rocker that turned me from punk rock and skateboarding as the most important things in life to Jesus and His Word as the most important thing in life. That's the book. That's the book, The Great Controversy, that got me on the straight and narrow. Thank you, Jesus. And look at what it says in The Great Controversy. Ellen White, one of the formative, pivotal members of the se- uh, founding members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible. What's the next word? Only. Sounds like Luther. God will have a people on the earth that will maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all, what's the next word? Reforms. So what Luther began there in 1517 by the coining of this really simple, really pithy phrase, sola scriptura, is something that extends right down to the present, right down to today. And then Ellen White, she says that there will be a people on earth that will say, you know what? Not the creeds, not the councils, not the church, not science, not philosophy. What does Scripture say? Light into darkness. Now, sola fide, faith alone. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, two of the best known verses in all the New Testament, in all of the corpus of Paul. For by grace you have been saved. What are the next two words, everyone? Through faith, not through works. Not through my own righteousness, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this faith is not your own doing. Can somebody say amen? Oh, I hope that you need to hear the gospel today, church. Martin Luther famously said, people need to hear the gospel every day because they forget it every day. So we're going to preach the gospel today. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. I love the way that Paul says it in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. He says that this faith is a faith that God has given us. Even your faith is a gift from God. Even the faith that we present to God as an act of belief, as an act of surrender, is not our own faith. It's God's faith that He extends to us as a gift. Now, this is really cool. Back to one of the founding members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church again, Ellen White, in her little book, Education. Amazing book. I know it's one of Paul Fua's favorites. Principle of TVAC. Notice what it says here. And I've purposefully oriented the, 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 the statement, the sentence, this way. And I'll show you why in just a second. She says, faith that enables us to receive God's gift is itself a gift. Now, I've, I've oriented it this way purposely because that enables us to receive God's gift is what's known in English grammar as a prepositional phrase. A prepositional phrase is a modifying phrase, right? A phrase that tells us a little bit more about the thing that we are speaking of. For example, I might say, that is my Bible on the table, right? That is my Bible, there's your sentence, on the table modifies. You know in English grammar, if you're dealing with a prepositional phrase, if you can remove the prepositional phrase from the sentence and the sentence maintains its basic thrust and structure, okay? So I could say, that is my Bible, period, or I can say, that is my Bible, comma, on the table, There's your prepositional phrase, on the table. 
I've marked out the prepositional phrase for you here. Rochelle, I hope I get this right. If I get it wrong, I apologize in advance. Faith that enables us to receive God's gift is itself a gift. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drop out that prepositional phrase. Okay, I'm just going to drop it out, not because it's unimportant, but because it's a modifying phrase so that we can get to the kernel or the embryo of the very point that's being made here. And notice when we put it together, what we have is, why don't you read it with me? Faith is itself a gift. Can you say amen? Faith is a gift. It's the faith of Jesus. Not just my faith in Jesus, it's the faith of Jesus. She says, there is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, I hope I'm earnest today, repeated more frequently, I'm going to repeat myself several times today, or established more firmly in the minds, I can't do that for you, only you can do that for you, and the Spirit can do that for you, so I hope you're paying attention. There is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all than the, what's the underlined word? Impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. And then this sentence, this crucially important sentence right here, salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Now here again, I've organized this sentence with a prepositional phrase right there sort of in the center, in Jesus Christ. Now that's, that's implicit for us that are believers in Jesus. So we're going to lift that phrase out, not because it's unimportant, but so that we can get to the kernel of what's being communicated here. So we lift that part out in Jesus Christ, and we're left with this. Salvation, why don't you say it with me? Salvation is through... Oh, you need to say it a little with a little more enthusiasm than that. Salvation is through what, what, what? Sola fide. Not faith and works. Salvation, your salvation... Your eternal right standing with God is through faith alone. Say it with me if if you would just one more time. Through faith alone. I know that can be hard, especially for generational Seventh-day Adventists to say. They say, salvation is through faith. I know it starts with an A. And, and, and there's a struggle that's going on in their mouth and in their mind. It's through faith. Say it with me. What's the word? Alone. The next one is sola gratia, through grace alone. Not only faith alone, but grace alone. Back to Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace, by means of grace, grace is the conduit. Grace is not the conduit. Grace is the the catalyst. Faith is the conduit. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this faith is not your own doing. As we've already said, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Back to Luther. The statement that really resonated and began to ricochet and reverberate around in the mind of Luther was this statement, the just, the righteous, shall live by, does anybody know it? Faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And in that book there that I mentioned earlier, The Great Controversy, the story is told of Luther going in 1510 to Rome. He went there to deliver a message and also on a pilgrimage. And when he went to Rome, he was going to various sites and performing his pilgrimage duties and acquiring some relics. And one of the sites that, I mean, it's a 1,500-mile walk. It's like a 2,500-kilometer walk. He walked from Wittenberg to Rome. That's a long walk. It took him almost two and a half months to walk it, right? He might have hitched a ride on a few wagons here and there. But he walked that under his own power. And when you get there, you you got to go to the various pilgrimage sites. And one of the key pilgrimage sites that you had to go to was what's called the Scala Sancta. The Scala Sancta, otherwise known as Pilate's Staircase. Pilate's Staircase was was the supposedly, there are a lot of these relics in Rome, but supposedly, and there is some reason to believe it might be the case, supposedly the very staircase that Jesus had walked up and down when he received the judgment of condemnation from Pilate. And supposedly Constantine's mother, Helena, had transported this staircase from Jerusalem to Rome. Brought it to Rome. And, a, and set it up there. And so what pilgrims would do is they would go to the Scala Sancta and they would get on their knees and they would climb up the stairs as an act of penance and as an act of pilgrimage. That staircase is still in Rome. Scotty and I went. Lynn and I went. We went there. We went to the staircase. It's still there. And there are still pilgrims today going up on it on their knees. So you know me. I'm not going to let that go. Right? I'm in Rome. 
and I'm going to go up that staircase on my knees. And so I got, I got there not as an act of penance, not as a Catholic, but as a Bible-believing, spirit-filled Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I said, man, if it was good enough for Luther, if that's where Luther got his revelation, the just shall live by faith. I'm going to go up that thing on my knees. And on every step, I'm going to pray, God, show me what it means the just shall live by faith. And so I had a nun on this side and a priest on this side and a nun up there, and I was surrounded by Catholic pilgrims, and it took me about 25 minutes, and my knees were killing me at the top of those stairs. Prayed on every stair, God, show me what it means. The just shall live by faith. I put that up on my Instagram account, and I had a few very conservative Seventh-day Adventists accuse me of becoming a Catholic. That's all right. I don't mind. I don't mind. I knew it would be a little racy, but I wanted to do it anyway. I mean, I thought, I, I, even as I was going up, I was thinking, was this the stair that Luther had his revelation on? Was this the stair that he had his revelation on? Was this the stair that he had his revelation on? For me, that revelation would have happened on about the second stair because it hurts. <laughs> it hurts. It's not happening on stair number 22. It's happening on stair 2. So Luther, is re- he's reflecting back on that experience of, of the just shall live by faith, knocking around in his brain, there from Romans 1, quoted from Habakkuk 2, the just shall live by faith, the just shall live by faith. Here he is, a dutiful, uh, obsessive, compulsive, and overly conscientious monk, and it's just rattling around in his brain. We'll talk more about Luther on the 25th. Rattling around in his brain, the just shall live by faith, the just shall live by faith, the just shall live by faith. And it was on that staircase, as he was making his way up in an act of penance. God, are you happy yet? Are you, my knees really hurt. Are you happy yet, God? What more do I have to do? I'll do it again. I'll do it again and again. And it was somewhere on that staircase when the knee pain went shooting to his hip and he said, wait a minute, what am I doing on my knees? The just shall live by faith. And this is a more mature Luther reflecting back. He was a, he was a, 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 a voluminous writer. And this is him reflecting back and he says, night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement, the just shall live by faith. I pondered night and day. I pondered night and day. Then I grasped that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy. Oh, I love that. Through grace and what, everyone? Sheer mercy. God justifies, declares righteous through faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. As this giant load of righteousness by works, this giant load of guilt, this giant load of shame, this giant load of a millennium of the accumulations of medieval Christianity fell off of his neck. And he said, the gospel is that the just live by faith that is itself a gift from God. Night and day, he says, he pondered it. Through grace alone. Back to Ellen White again. I want you to be rooted today not only in your Protestant heritage, but in your Seventh-day Adventist heritage, for those of you that are Seventh-day Adventists. In the book, God's Amazing Grace, she says divine grace is needed at the when? When is divine grace needed? It's needed at the beginning. Divine grace is needed at every step of advance. That's what we call the middle. And divine grace can complete the work of salvation. Just let that settle into your souls. Let that settle into your brains. Let that settle into your past, into your present, into your heart, into your fears, into your failures, into your struggles. Just let this great truth settle upon you right now. You need divine grace at the beginning of your journey. You need divine grace at every step in the middle of your journey. And it is only divine grace that will complete your journey toward God. It's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. No wonder the reformers insisted, sola gratia. Only grace. Only grace. The church had established a very complicated and and superstitious ceremony of sacraments and rites and rituals, and it was impossible to know what your standing was with God. And if you didn't get it all quite right, you could go to purgatory for several thousand or even million years. Ah, fooey on all of that, said Luther. Away with all of that gobbledygook and poppycock. The truth is the just live by faith. Faith alone, grace alone. Solus Christus, Christ alone. One of, the great, one of the great tragedies of the medieval church was the obfuscation. That means the clouding, the fogging. The clouding, the fogging of Jesus and his high priestly ministry. 
You couldn't just go right to Jesus. Oh, no, 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 no. You had to go through saints, through patrons, and if all else failed, through Mary herself. The idea that you could approach God directly was considered absurd. You had to go through the local priest and the confessional. You had to go through the sacraments. There were seven sacraments in medieval Christianity, and you had to work your way through the sacraments, work your way through the ceremonies, work your way through the pilgrimages. And again, there is no assurance in this. There is no certainty in this. There is no confidence in this. You're never quite sure of your standing. Have I done enough? And the answer is no, you have not done enough. But Jesus did more than enough. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ alone. From the great controversy, I actually read you this the other day, but it's so good, I had to read it again. I actually read you this in the last sermon I preached here, but I couldn't resist. Back to that book, The Great Controversy, describing the conversion of one John Wesley, born in 1700, having this experience somewhere around 1730. On his return to England from the United States, Wesley, under the instruction of a Moravian pe- preacher. How many of you remember this? I told you the story. They were in a ship, and they thought the ship was going to sink. Remember this? And Wesley was concerned. Nobody was afraid to die from the Moravians. Not the men, not the women, not the children. Under the instruction of a Moravian preacher, Wesley arrived at a clear understanding of Bible faith. He was convinced that he must renounce how much dependence on his own works? How much dependence? All dependence on his own works for salvation and, okay, well then what must I do? If I'm renouncing all trust in me, I must put all trust wholly in the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. At a meeting of the Moravian Missionary Society in London, a statement was read from Luther. Oh, man, I'm going to talk about that on the 25th, how a baton, or as you Aussies would say, a baton, was handed from person to person, reformer to reformer, decade to decade, century to century, and it had been handed on beginning before Luther, through Luther, and then now it's placed in Wesley's hands by the writings of Luther, even though Luther's been dead for more than 130 years. He goes and he sits down in a meeting, and Luther, there's so much power, there's so much light in what God was doing through Luther that Wesley sits down, he hears the writings of Luther describing the change which the Spirit of God works in the heart of the believer. As Wesley listened, faith was kindled in his soul, and he says, this is quoting Wesley now, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. What are the next two words? Christ alone. Solus Christus. He says, man, I, I, I finally felt that I trusted in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And when you trust in Christ alone, what is given to you? What was given to Wesley? An assurance was given to me. A confidence, a certainty, an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Through long years of wearisome and comfortless striving, years of rigorous self-denial, of reproach and humiliation, Wesley had steadfastly adhered to his one purpose of seeking God. Man, he was, he was earnest, but now he found him, Jesus, and he found that the grace that he had toiled to win by prayers and fasts and offerings and self-denial was a gift. It was a what, everyone? What was it? It was a gift without money and without price. After he received that gift, he had the same experience, frankly, that I had or that Luther had and that many of you have had. I hope all of you. Once he was established in the faith of Christ, his whole soul burned with the desire to spread everywhere a knowledge of the glorious gospel of God's free grace. Once you've received the good news of salvation through grace alone and faith alone and Christ alone, you want to tell people. And, And Wesley wanted to tell not just his neighborhood, Wesley wanted to tell the world, and the guy was an absolute hero. Traveling some 200,000 miles, either on foot or on the back of a horse or a donkey. 200,000 miles. Preached in excess of 40,000 sermons. His brother Charles, his brother Charles Wesley wrote 5,000 hymns. These guys were, were prolific, to say the least. And look at what Wesley says, I look upon the world as my parish. My church is not just the local Kingscliff Church. My church, he says, is not just this local assembly people, of people here in, in London. The world is my church. The world is my congregation. And he was particularly passionate about England, his homeland. In whatever part of it I am, I judge it meet and right and my bounden duty to declare unto all that are willing to hear the glad tidings of salvation. Wherever I am, I'm going to preach the truth of salvation. I stood in this man's bedroom just a few days ago. 
I stood, I, I stood in the pulpit that this man preached thousands of sermons from just a few days ago. This is myself and Dr. Nicholas Miller. He's the head of the church history department at Andrews University at the seminary. He and I co-led the tour uh, with another Waldensian pastor named Esteban. There were three of us co-leading this group of 103 people. And here we are standing in front of Wesley's Chapel. And that's a statue of John Wesley. And it's difficult to see even with these excellent projectors. But just below John Wesley, there's a little plaque there. And it says, the world is my parish. The world is my church. Oh, it's so amazing. In fact, if you're on Instagram, you can go and see. I went into Wesley's bedroom, and probably against the better uh, desires of the people that curate uh, the Wesleyan house, I put on Wesley's wig. It looked terrible on me. I looked like a silver-haired rock and roller, but it looked great on Wesley. It looked really great on Wesley, man. I wish that would come back in style, those big, long wigs. It would be so much better for those of us that are losing our hair, right? Just these big silver wigs and long black robes. Man, it looked great. It looked great on him would look absurd on me, of course. She continues, he continued his strict and self-denying life, not now as the ground, but the result of faith. Not the root, but the fruit of holiness. The grace of God in Christ is the foundation of the Christian's hope, and that grace will be manifested in obedience. My clicker is not manifesting itself in obedience. Just give me a click there, Nate, if you would. Next one, jump through. Friends, I want to say this to you just to simplify this idea of in Christ alone. Believers do not work for salvation. We work from it. All of your good works, all of your offerings, all of the things that you do are not on the side working toward in the equation of salvation. You're not working toward salvation. They're on the other side of the equation. We work from salvation, not toward it and not for it. Next slide. Works are not a condition of salvation. They are a consequence of those that have truly been saved. Can the church say amen? Okay. So there we have it. Back one. Nate, thanks, mate. So there you have it. Only Scripture, only faith, only grace, and only Christ. And therefore, it was demanded. The Reformers, it was just, it was just essential that they say, well, wait a minute. If it's all faith, and it's all Christ, and it's all grace, and it's all Scripture, then it can't be to David Asherick's glory. It can't be to the church's glory. It can't be to the priest's glory. And it certainly can't be to the cardinal's or the pope's glory. It has to be soli deo gloria. It has to be to the glory of God alone. Can the church say amen? That's why. That's why. When we see Jesus there on the sea of glass in eternity, when those opening moments of eternity are beginning and crowns are placed on our heads, we take the crowns off of our heads and we put them where we are confident, certain they belong at the feet of Jesus. And we sing again and again, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. All the glory, all the praise, all the honor goes to God and Christ alone. Next slide there. So I want to close on this last like two minutes here. Friends, there is the Reformation that we've been talking about historically and theologically. There is the Reformation, but there is also the me Reformation. In the reforming and the forming, God speaks light into darkness. This is not only an historical reality, right? We're not only celebrating a 500-year anniversary here. We are celebrating the ongoing spirit of reform, the principle of reform. Friends, there's one, it's one thing to believe in and have confidence in and to know a little bit about the Protestant Reformation. But at least as important for you is not just the, but the me Reformation. And friends, if you're going to be reformed, if you're going to be transformed, if you're going to be renewed, the root word there, new, you're going to have to have the same thing that God always uses to form and reform, light. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. At some point, it's going to have to be more Scripture and less YouTube, more Scripture and less television, more Scripture and less NRL, more Scripture. And I'm not saying none of the other. I'm just saying put it in the balances, weigh it out, and just ask yourself, if, if, if my priorities reflect the fact that, that I need light in my life. In fact, we said there were four essential ingredients for the Reformation. I want to tell you there are the same four essential ingredients for the me Reformation. If your life is a mess, which let me just let you in on a little secret right now, it is apart from Jesus. 
Did you hear what I said? Your life is a mess apart from Jesus. So you got the mess covered. The message is always the same. God speaks his word into darkness. And so it's sola scriptura. It's the text. You've just got to be in the text. The means, I don't mind the means. You can have paper. You can have a phone. You can have a computer. You can have an audible. But you've got to be getting the word in your life. If the whole history of Western civilization can turn on the word, then your simple little wonderful little life can turn on the word as well. If God can move nations, if God can move a whole civilization by the word, he can move your life through the word. And then you need a man. But notice that I've capitalized it here because you don't need just a man, lowercase Martin Luther. You need the man, the same man that Luther himself needed, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, your life is a mess. You need the message of Scripture. You need whatever means it takes to get Scripture into your life. And when you do that, the man Jesus Christ becomes not just an idea, not just a concept, not just an historical figure. He becomes your Savior. And you will have the Lutheran, the the Wesleyan experience of being able to say, I felt that I entered when that guilt and shame fell off of my shoulders into the very doors of paradise. Friends, today we are believers in Jesus. Today we are Christians. And today we celebrate that we are Protestants, protesting the deformation and crying out in our own lives for the reformation of Christ in us, the hope of glory. How many today want to say with me, I need, I, me, I, my family, me, I need Reformation. Father in heaven, we bow our heads here and we raise our hands and we confess that we are formed, yes, but we are deformed in our actions, in our attitudes, in our words, in our thoughts, in our habits, in our spending, in our recreation, in our lusts. Father, we are not all bad, but there is enough bad in us that the deformation, and the mess is overwhelming. So, Father, we need to be reformed, and we pray that you would speak light into darkness. We claim the promise of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts, our hearts, our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Let all of God's reformers say, Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath.